Deborah and I are very pleased to be here. And one of the nice things about being at a fair are all the discoveries you make. You might come here looking to see particular works. It's the ones you discover that you didn't know about that are most interesting. A lot of our collecting in Toronto relates to architecture, the intersection of art and architecture. And uh, so we've been on the lookout for a few things that uh, appeal to us and that are of interest to us. And we'll happy to be happy to talk about those things. And feel free as we walk to ask us questions if you'd like, as we uh, meander through the fair. And we're very pleased to be teamed uh, uh, and, and to learn from our, from our new friend from Lisbon, um, because Pedro has really helped us to understand some works. We've had a bit of an advantage. We got ahead of you, but you'll catch up to us in a few minutes. Deborah? Uh, I just want to say that when we, when we began and were I, I was sort of a little bit following Barry's interest in architecture. My concern was that it was very cold and that the works we were we were going to be acquiring would be extremely cool and always very rational. And I think it didn't take very long for me and I think Barry also to discover that there's really a lot of emotion in some of the works that pertain to architecture. And I think we're going to see that on our, on our, on our walk. And um, I, I will just add that um, as an architect, initially by education, I moved towards the art world, but always kept my connection, obviously, to architecture. And I've been always a defender of the communication between the two fields, because uh, if architecture loses sight, sight of its artistic side, obviously, it loses a lot. But I, I discovered over time that there were lots of artists that were really interested, not only in architecture, but also in urban culture, in the city. And this is something that you'll see through the works we've chosen, that there is crossover of using architecture or the city to think about broader questions that affect society today. So by artists, by looking at architecture, by looking at structures in the city, by looking at uh, really the way cities work, they give us a reflection on what is going on around us. And I think that's part of why we feel fascinated by these artists that establish these connections between the worlds of art and architecture. So it's really a themed tour of the fair in that sense. Pedro, I just, I just want to say one thing. Um, something Pedro reminded me of yesterday is that originally art, art schools and architecture schools were together. Years ago, they split apart. Some of them are coming back together again. And so the two disciplines used to inform each other, and they've, they've lost uh, track of each other. The only other thing I want to say is I'm not an architect. Deborah and I were happy to discover, however, that a number of the artists we collect were trained as architects. Maybe they couldn't earn enough money as architects. They certainly didn't earn much as young artists, but many of them are trained as architects. So that connects a lot of uh, the work that we collect. So we're going to start walking famous Italian gallery, which has the work of two artists that we've chose for, I guess, different reasons. Um, one of those was uh, actually a common choice immediately. Uh, it was Carlos Garaycoa, an artist who comes from Havana and who has worked with between the works of the fields of photography, uh, of course, installation, sculpture, and you can actually see a very, very good exhibition of his uh, at uh, the Fondacion Mers uh, currently here at, in Torino. And uh, I must confess, I've worked with uh, Carlos Garaycoa this year. We made a big installation with him at MAT because he's precisely one of those artists who has always been interested in architecture. And by looking at Havana and the way Havana was evolving due, from the 50s and 60s until today, he could really trace the social history of what was going on uh, in, uh, in this uh, city and in this country under the communist regime. So he was really talking with his works, with his series of works about the things that were disappearing from the city as he was walking along the city and he retraced from old photography, he retraced the buildings that he knew were in these places with this thread. And he has used this thread in different kinds of installations and has used this technique uh, for a long time now. But of course he has worked uh, in many other media, but always concerned with urban culture, with uh, what you can discover 
uh, in the city that expresses how people relate, how political systems uh, really leave their marks uh, in society. And I'll just add one thing, referencing what Deborah said a few moments ago. This work is very much about memory. As you see the building as it was, and now it's an empty lot with just the slat uh, fence, and you see the beautiful image of the building that was created from memory. And so it really is an emotional piece and an homage to what was there. But talk about ghost of a building. So we had another work that we were going to uh, show you, but it has been sold and it's gone. So it's only a memory now. What we're see, seeing here is the work of Celine Condorelli, who is actually here. And so I would, I think whenever the artist is present, I think the artist should be the one talking about the pieces because I think hers will be the best explanation possible of what is happening here. So I introduce you to Celine Condorelli. I feel a bit caught like a rabbit, <laughs> I have to admit. But uh, I mean, this is a body of work that was developed over like quite a long period of time. And it follows my interest uh, on the work of uh, an Italian architect who went to live in Brazil called Lina Bobardi. She had a very particular notion of culture, which in her view should include playgrounds, children, therefore, and uh, playing um, as part of the, the cultural responsibility of the museum somehow. So there's a quote by her that is on this piece there on the corner that um, a museum should include a collection, a playground, as well as uh, popular arts, and by that she actually meant craft. So I've been really interested in this notion of an inclusive uh, culture and an inclusive museum, and I've looked at it in sort of different angles. And uh, the, on the back wall are a series of studies on existing playgrounds that were connected to museums by different architects. There's Lina Bobardi, Aldo Van Eyck, Pale Nielsen, my own survey of playgrounds. And the whole thing is framed around these weird shapes that you see here. There's one here, which is, this is the children's portal, it's an entrance. One on the wall over there, which is a masking tape, a piece called uh, Horror of Air Conditioning, and one in the frames here. And these are all one-to-one -one drawings of uh, Lina Bobardi's windows in one of the buildings that she made in Sao Paulo called Cesc Pompeia. So I literally use her work as a lens to look at the possibilities for culture. So that's why all of the archival photographs you will see are of what play means in the place of culture. I just want to say one of the wonderful discussions that uh, Pedro and Deborah and I have been having over the last couple of days is the role of architecture in society, the impact of architecture and design uh, on our societies. I serve on the Canadian, the board of the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal, and one of the things we're very focused on is the impact of architecture and design uh, on, on the world that we live in. And Pedro and Deborah and I have talked about the crucial challenge for architects today to reconnect and, with the world and to respond to some of the challenges we see in the world today, whether that is climate, overpopulation, migration, uh, issues like that. And you can go through the children's portal for those who are young at heart. We're on our way to Prometeo Gallery, where we're going to see the work of Hiwa K, uh, which was one of the outstanding works at uh, Documenta in Castle this uh, summer. Deborah and I saw this video work uh, at Documenta just a few months ago in Castle, Germany, and we were quite taken with it. Somebody, uh, a dealer who we respect, had said, if you only see one thing in Documenta, you must see this, this film. And it um, uh, was very important for a number of reasons to us. Uh, first of all, it is an, a, a view, there's a model in the museum next to it, of the city of Castle, Germany, right at the end of the Second World War, the bombed out city. It was very severely bombed during the war. And that's what you're looking at. Uh, and as the camera pans this model of the city, which is in the room next to the video, there is a narrator, a narrator talking about the immigrant's experience, the, the something we read so much about today, migration from one place to another, and sometimes the false identities that people have to assume to qualify for residency in a strange country, and how difficult it is to invent a story about your past if you can't pr provide documentation when all you have is an aerial overhead view of a bombed out city. Perhaps you're a Syrian who's left homes or the outskirts of Damascus, 
seeking refugee status mm -hmm. somewhere in Europe or North America, and you have to recreate and answer all the questions about where you are from, what street you lived on, describe the street, because they're testing you. And all you have is your memory, again, this is about memory, and the overhead view of a, of a destroyed, how could you find your home and your street in that mess? Uh, this is also a little bit about, it's going to start again in a moment, um, dystopia, which is, I know, something Pedro knows a lot about. Iwake is an artist that has been getting a lot of attention over the last few months, I would say. And we had the pleasure to work with him also on a, sh on a video show, uh, which precisely relates to this idea that video is more and more a tool that allows artists to really portray uh, current situations in a way that is more dense, richer in narrative terms, in the conjunction of imagery, storytelling, and so on and so on. So I think um, I was actually introduced by uh, Deborah and Barry to this video because I didn't know this uh, work particularly. And it was wonderful to listen to them describing this work of these artists I was working with. Uh, because it is another completely different angle. The other piece we had, again, relates to a lived situation in the city. It's about these uh, Iwake being part of a demonstration uh, in, uh, in Kurdistan, where, uh, of course, uh, protesters are being hit by tear gas, and they use lemons to, uh, um, to actually protect their eyes and, and, their, and their mouth and so on. But he's playing, he's doing a performance, and he's getting involved in the action by playing this Sergio Leone melody from the Once Upon a Time in the West. So he really gets involved in these uh, social situations. And I think this is how, for us, it was important to work with this kind of artists currently, because I think it uh, shows a moment which is politically very tense, very dystopian in certain aspects. And in, in that respect, I think the political responsibility of artists is coming back very strongly. And I think uh, many curators, many artists have felt this already within the uh, art world, but I think the audiences in general are also being made aware of this role of art, not, o not only towards an idea of contemplation, but also towards a critical idea about thinking about the current situation and what artists perceive of that situation that is enlightening for all of us. So I, I just want to add one thing, it's, and, and it's been a great pleasure to, to meet and talk with Pedro over the last couple of days. Uh, we are very interested, Deborah and I, in, in De Stijl, the, the movement out of the Netherlands that was the rival compound to the Bauhaus. Both of those movements, uh, born just before the First World War, but very much after the destruction of the First World War, looked for a utopian vision of society, a unity of, of graphic art, art, architecture, social housing, social policy, um, very utopian. This work is very dystopian. This is about a different kind of outcome. This is after yet another conflict. And um, you have a show on called From Utopia, Utopia to Dystopia, Dystopia. Yes. at the museum in... in uh, yes. But the idea is not to be pessimistic or to just, you know, embrace the idea of dystopia. It's precisely to understand that this critical perspective help us think about these issues and try to resist them. So it's really about the optimism of getting back into some sort of utopia uh, in regards to situations that are very dramatic and very harsh. I mean, like the migration crisis, we have to rethink things and we have to be helped to rethink those things. So this is the gallery of Anka Bodelash okay. <laughs> from Bucharest, who we were very pleased to meet yesterday. And the artist we are interested here in here is um, named Aurora Kirali. She's a photographer and was a, a professor of photography for a long time. Still, oh, still, and had not uh, made art in quite a while. She had the first photography art gallery in Bucharest for 10 years, and then she closed the gallery. And so for this work, she went back into her own archives and uh, pulled out photographs that still had uh, sort of resonance and meaning for her, and then created uh, these constructions, the two little sculptures and the wall piece, as viewfinders in a way of looking through a camera, but it was very clear to us as soon as we saw them that the viewfinders were very much informed by 
uh, a sense of modernist architecture uh, if you take a, a look. And we were quite captivated. I just want to say, if you look inside, you'll see photographs that, <laughs> that she has taken. Uh, and there's the wall work. Um, we have, in fact, purchased one of these works, and I think the second one has been purchased also, another one, yes, right? So is this your first time at the fair? No, the fourth time. Fourth time. the first time that we present two female Romanian artists. So, so first two, two, presenting two female Romanian artists. So we were quite struck by the work, and, and uh, Deborah and I had a bit of a laugh because, uh, you know, we've moved from work that is very smooth, from photography uh, into painting, and now most of our work is, um, has texture, and what's interesting is the, uh, some of the things we bought most recently all involve corrugated cardboard. We're in our corrugated cardboard period for some reason. I think this will be the fourth work that we have that's uh, cardboard to our houses and one is um, a shelf unit that's actually been heavily treated to make it very, very strong, but it started out in life as a FedEx box. So it also, it's, for us, it's very interesting to see artists repurposing um, ordinary things like boxes into into wonderful and, and quite moving works of art. No, I'm seeing this for the first time and for me the interesting aspect is this going back to the origins of photography where you produce the idea of lights going through a box and creating the print. Um, but simultaneously also this, I'm very inf uh, interested at this moment this, in this return of informality of something that is uh, like a, almost an art povera uh, phenomenon that is going across, I see, in many situations. And uh, I think it's a way of artists also, again, producing a reflection on what is going on uh, around us. So I think, uh, and it's just beautiful. But I'm, I'm curious because maybe people are also curious about these. Uh, like you said here, you were just struck by the work. What moves you to acquire these works and... <laughs> Um, somebody asked me that question earlier. Price does not move us. In fact, if it's expensive, we're very unmoved. Uh, we don't often buy an impulse. If it's inexpensive work, it's a safe decision to make. If it's more expensive work, we always want to think about it. But work needs to bother us. It needs to stay with us. So the viewfinder, which I think looks like a modernist home to me, has been bothering us. Um, and we acquired it yesterday, and I'm, I'm coming back and seeing it for the first time since then, and I'm quite pleased to see it. Deborah, I want you to answer one other question I know people always ask us when we do art tours in our home, is how do we decide on something between the two of us? <laughs> um, she decides. No, actually, we really have a, an iterative process that involves a lot of talking, but we always just about always agree. Occasionally one of us goes rogue and buys something small without the other, but almost never. Um, we don't fight. Um, it's a good discussion and since we're empty nesters, it, <laughs> it, it, there's, always, there's always a conversation, which is a good thing. So just two other things before we, we move on. This actually is inexpensive work, I'm happy to report. I know there's more available. There's a wonderful video, which I did not see yesterday on the wall. Olivia Michalzano, she's a Romanian artist as well. They are from different generations, 10 years. So we wanted to present also two artists from different generations working with photography, film, talking about, uh, like here, Olivia, she's influenced and inspired by Antonioni when in 60, 70, she's talking about the emancipation. This is the word in English, no. Emanciparia femei, so the woman. And uh, she's, The Island is uh, the movie. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Well, we're going to move on. One thing I'll say as we walk is that Deborah and I have moved to buy art, taking it off the wall. It's, we've moved from painting and photography to sculpture and works that come off the wall, and that, that piece particularly. Okay, away we go. Booth of Marceau from Mexico City, and this work is by uh, a German artist named Michael Conrads. And it, if any of you have been to Mexico City or are familiar with the work of Luis Barragan, <coughs> this, the, the color palette in these works references Barragan, who's a very, very important, world-renowned uh, modernist. And these works are 
made of uh, old canvases taken on stretchers and they, he really intended to reference um, both the gentrification of neighborhoods in Mexico City where older homes are often taken down. And also I think uh, more recently it makes us think of the uh, earthquake damage which damaged a lot of uh, older beautiful buildings and which probably will not be able to be restored. And so he, it's a very, very, um, what appealed to us I think was that it was, it's a very, it's, it's very rough and uh, it's also got a lot of history because all of these these uh, bits have been taken off of stretchers of other works. Yeah. And actually what I like about these, and especially this was another piece you introduced me to, and, um, and what I think is interesting is that although you could look at it just as a formal composition with color and so on, when you get to understand that there are, there are so many layers of meaning I think it makes, it makes you think about how art indeed gets these different uh, meanings together and references to the city, to the life um, that is going on in cities. And so the fact that here the artist is almost an ethnographer registering the traces of what is going on in his city, I think it makes it very beautiful because at the same time there is an aesthetic composition, of course, which relates back to art history and to the kind of compositions you would expect with just an abstract um, uh, notion behind it. When I walked in Havana a couple of years ago, and you see this in some cities wherever you see buildings that have fallen down and other buildings that are standing next to it, and you see the wallpaper in one room and the painting from another room and the tile from an old bathroom, I have a memory in my mind of a scene like that as I walked in, in some of the destroyed areas of Havana. And that's what immediately came to mind as I looked at, at this work. It's as if you're looking at the side of a bunch of rooms in an apartment building, perhaps, and all the fading paint and wallpaper and tile that are left when the building has come down. So again, about memory and, and great beauty. So we just heard that this was one of the honorable mentions in the Ely Prize, so we were very happy because we had uh, chosen this work again with a very strong relationship to architecture, architecture interiors and how people leave those interiors and have an imagination of these interiors. What the artist did, and I have the galleries here, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Joanna Piotrowska, who is a Polish artist, uh, was that she started actually in Lisbon this uh, sort of residency, working with local people and asking them to rebuild their childhood memories and how they would occupy with just using furniture, how they would build their own architecture within their homes. And then she moved on to another city and she's again tracking these uh, representations that people have of themselves inside their homes. And I thought the work was very touching and very impressive. So basically the project started in Lisbon. We, she told me about the project and we invited her to stay one month to realize it. This brought to the solo show that she had at the gallery um, this year. Basically what the project, what it is, it is uh, trying to enter people's places and start playing with them about this, you know, this thing that we all did uh, as kids doing a little fort with the objects that are in your place. And uh, then she took the photograph of the creators of this little architecture and uh, also of the architectures themselves. What uh, is very interesting is that, I mean, these people are adults, they're not kids anymore, so they know exactly they're going to be photographed. There is a whole psychological play in uh, in play in this uh, in this uh, performative act that brings uh, to the final picture so they choose carefully the objects they want to represent themselves uh, through the objects and then there's also this uh, relation with the architecture that is interesting because from time to time they just build the shelters too small for their adult bodies. So the body is so intention in trying to enter, and this is a main interest of the artist, the relationship between the body and everything that is external to it. Also, one important fact to mention is that when you are an adult and you are building a shelter, most probably you're not really playing. It's a more serious problem, but this fact is basically negated by 
the fact that all of these are in domestic spaces. So it's houses inside an house or inside the garden in the case of the external shots. All these elements concur to create the tension that is there in the image and that is presented instead in a very playful setting. So every time she wants to use a different strategy that reminds you of the playfulness of the first game, which is, you know, these colorful walls, a carpet that is very domestic, and a hanging that looks like a teenager poster room. And I guess the, there is the political innuendo also here in terms of refuge, building refuge and commenting, as we saw also in the work of EUAK, commenting on the situation of refugees in a very subtle and distant way, which I think is also important when artists are... Um, reflecting on on these issues that affect us, but always manage to keep this aesthetic position of looking into it and not being too obvious or too direct about it. And I think you'll want to take a closer look at each of the images and see that in some cases the person who built it is there and in the next image it's empty. Um, it's very moving, very moving work. It resonates, I think, with every one of us. I think we were all children once. Um, but the fact that it is adults, uh, and at this time when we see as we drive around cities or perhaps take the train between cities uh, and we see refugee camps, as you said, we see makeshift um, uh, places of habitation, and then you see this very domestic setting. It's, it's very beautiful work. I find it also very unsettling, um, and, and I think work should bother you a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you.